what do we value related to the environment and natural resources? Folks have, you know, tried to come up with different categories of, you know, the types of things that we value related to um, ecosystem services. This chart was from the Millennial Ecosystem Assessment. It's one set of categories. Folks have gone back through and come up with different categorizations of values, but you can see things here like provisioning value. So if the environment is the ecosystems producing food like fish and shellfish, like I just talked about, that calculation of the ecosystem service of provisioning uh, food um, from, let's say, a fishery or, or aquaculture in, in the example I gave would fall under that category. There are regulating um, ecosystem services that could be valued. Pollination is, is one. There are cultural. In this particular classification, things like recreation show up in the cultural category. These are all things that ecosystems produce, ecosystem services that potentially could be valued. And you can see on the bottom there, there are supporting things as well. So a lot of these things end up falling into the indirect valuation, things like supporting nutrient cycling. We may not directly value nutrient cycling. We may value it because it impacts these other uh, roles and uh, services that the ecosystem provides. These different types of values, whether they're um, from this ecosystem services list or another one, is going to influence how we measure them. My quick example of a use value of farming of oysters, for example, but it could be fishing, um, it could be a lot of other activities, provisioning activities that we get from an ecosystem are examples of use values where you can observe the behavior or choices and get prices and quantities. So particularly when you have a market. So that simple example is how we do the valuation when we have price and quantity data and we get the market value. And those producer and consumer surpluses um, calculations are what we're trying to measure. The gets really interesting when we move from the non-market value. Here, it's a use value. We can observe people making choices, but we don't observe prices. Think about recreational fishing or kayaking or hiking. The individual is both the producer and the consumer. So there isn't a market observation. There are exceptions to that. If you go recreational fishing, you may go on a charter boat or a, a party or head boat and pay a fee to go fishing. And we might be able to use that information. But the vast majority of recreational activities don't have that type of market exchange. So how are we going to measure these surpluses, particularly that consumer surplus? Because if there isn't really a producer um, like the uh, oyster grower, we don't have to worry about that side of the equation, but there is a consumer, there is somebody that's getting impacted. By definition, there's nothing to observe directly. We can't observe behavior related, but these things doesn't mean these things don't have values in terms of the definitions that I provided early on. It's just that we can't observe it. And the, some examples of these types of values, one that you probably heard about, you know, because it's been talked about uh, extensively in, in the general literature on valuation is existence value. You don't plan to use something, you don't interact with it in any way, you're not going to visit it and see some, you know, pristine ecosystem, but you just care about its existence and you have a willingness to pay for the existence of that state of the world. Uh, you may have altruistic values that you care about other people's values. And so even though you're not interested or, or utilizing that ecosystem, ecosystem service, you, you know that other people are. In the altruistic case, there may be other uses of the environment, um, ecosystem. You know, let's use uh, preservation of a pristine, a pristine ecosystem that perhaps is being uh, threatened, um, but not... Um, with any, uh, you have no plans to visit that ecosystem to, you know, go recreating there, um, you know, but you know that there are um, maybe local populations that rely on that ecosystem. So that could, um, you know, both for use value or it could be spiritual value or something like that. And so 
you care about those individuals or that group. That would be an altruistic value. Whereas the existence value would be, you don't even care about that. You just, you know, there's nobody, there, there's some very remote, um, you know, ecosystem that um, you're never going to interact with, um, but you care that it it's being preserved in some way. And it doesn't have to be remote. So it could be, let me go to the Chesapeake Bay example. Um, so there are lots of ways that people value that resource, that ecosystem and it being healthy. So they want to go fishing in it. They want to recreate. They want to go boating. They want to go hiking on its shores and kayaking and have safe water. Um, and those are all things that one could value. Um, but th there are individuals, I, I would be one of them, um, that say, even if I never did any of those things, never interacted uh, with the Chesapeake Bay because I don't eat seafood from it or anything like that, I care that the Chesapeake Bay is a healthy ecosystem and should be functioning as a healthy ecosystem uh, unrelated to any use or altruistic value or anything like that. Um, so that would be an existence value. So I, I don't want to um, give the idea that it has to be you know, so remote that you never interact with it. Um, a lot of times, you know, and we'll talk about methodologies to measure existence value, but you could think about a survey where you ask people, what is your total value? What is your total willingness to pay to preserve the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem? And you'll get a number from that individual. And you'll have to figure out from that number what question they're answering. Are they answering, well, it's a high number because I go fishing there and I eat seafood from it. Um, some portion of that number may, it may it, not definitely, but it may be an existence value part of the equation. When we can observe people's behavior, we may be able to deduce from that behavior what they value and how they value it. When there, there is no observation, the only thing you can do is ask them in some sort of survey methodology. Bequest values, so we have multi-generations. And so you might want to forego some damage to an ecosystem, not because you think it will impact you or, or you know, your generation, but future generations to come. And then option value, which some may argue is a form of use value, you're willing to preserve the opportunity to utilize or interact with a resource in the future, although you don't have a uh, plan to utilize it now. These are the challenges that we face. This is the underpinning, this type of valuation of measuring these surpluses and the, the net um, maximum willingness to pay minus what you pay is sort of um, consistent throughout. The, the old form of this was something called contingent valuation. Um, and it got more and more sophisticated, but it was basically asking, what are you willing to pay to preserve this ecosystem, to preserve that species or something like that? Um, there are other surveys called stated preference choice experiments that are, are a little like old time marketing surveys about the attributes of ecosystems and what, and people making trade-offs within a survey. If you can only measure it with a survey, then you can't compare it to a non-survey technique. And then this concept of asking these willingness to pay questions, contingent valuation gets introduced into the say, yeah, we can measure these impacts. And the, the real world example was the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska, where um, a contingent valuation study was sort of first used in this way. So you know, the oil companies, Exxon and others were responsible for compensating for the losses um, due to the oil spill. And so the, the government actually, my agency, NOAA and, and others, you know, paid for studies to do, you know, what do people in the lower 48 that never are going to visit Alaska, you know, how much were they damaged um, through this contingent valuation study? And, you know, as Lisa said, the oil companies really, really fought and tried to undermine the acceptance of these studies because it, it would really make them liable in very real terms for the damages that they, they caused over and above the, um, the use impact damages, you know, on the fishing industry, that was a separate amount to be compensated. 
but this broader compensation of the people of the United States included um, estimates from this continued evaluation study. And just to end that kind of tale, what's interesting is a couple of years after that, because this became so controversial, NOAA formed a panel that they called the Blue Ribbon Panel. And I, at least I can't remember the year that that was done. Um, but the panel reviewed these um, techniques about just directly surveying people's value, existence values um, studies and concluded that yes, these methods were valid. There were some adjustments that needed to be made, but I just, interestingly, Robert Solo, who I uh, quoted in the beginning was one member of the Blue Ribbon Panel. So it was quite a dis distinguished panel that got this um, technique accepted into um, you know, the mix about making these kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm.